The 10.30 a.m. docket for Thursday, September 14th, 2023 consists of one case. Appeal number 124046, Timothy Town on behalf of himself and all others similarly situated versus USD 259 doing business as the Wichita Public Schools and USD 259 doing business as the Public Schools Base Plan, Sedgwick County briefs both sides. Good morning. Troy H. Gott for the plaintiff slash appellant, Timothy Town. And I would like at this time to reserve four minutes rebuttal. Four minutes is granted. Morning. Ryan Meyer uh, on behalf of Appley and Cross Appellant Unified School District number 259. It's a little bit longer caption on the bottom, but we'll just shorten it to that. Thank you. Your Honor, that concludes our 1030 docket. Thank you, Mr. Shima. Council, please uh, come forward to the council table. As you do that, um, I will uh, note something that I know the two of you are very familiar with, but um, some of those in the audience or our listeners may not be. Uh, we do have an empty chair. Justice Biles has recused in this matter. Uh, for those not familiar with court process, what that means is that he will not participate in today's hearing or in any part of the court's discussions or decision making in this case. So any discussion of the merits or writing or issuing of the decision will be done by the other members of the court without his participation. Scott, whenever you're ready, you can come to the podium or lectern. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Troy Gott. I'm representing the plaintiff slash appellant, Timothy Town. This appeal arises from the defendant subrogating plaintiff's third party tort recovery. And according to our theory of the case, the law prohibited this type of subrogation. And because of this prohibition, USD 259 was contractually unable to subrogate third-party tort cases of its insured. That's why we sued for breach of contract. Now, the statute, the standard of review is de novo. We're talking about interpretation of statutes and an interpretation of an insurance contract. I know the plan, I know USD 259 doesn't like to admit it, but even if you look at Sloan, they refer to it as an insurance policy. And it reads like an insurance policy, looks like an insurance policy. So therefore under the duck theory, it is an insurance policy. But the primary statute that expanded the anti-subrogation regulation is KSA 40-4602. And if you look at subparagraph C and D, the language is very expansive and it's very comprehensible. You don't have to go outside the plain language to know that USD 259 has a healthcare plan because it in fact issues an insurance policy and it's a health insurer who enters an agreement with its employees to provide the health insurance. 
that creates the health benefit plan, then as to be a health insurer, it said any health benefit plan that is regulated by the Kansas statutes annotated. Council, can I stop you there? And in line with your argument, I just want to do a little housekeeping so yes. I have some clarity on this somewhat confusing <laughs> matter. Um, am I correct that there really are only two legal rulings by the courts below that prevented you from continuing to assert your breach of contract claim? And I, the two that I'm thinking of are the ruling that 40-202B exempts uh, USD 259 from regulation by the insurance code. Yes. Is that one of them? That's one. And of the them. second would be the legal conclusion that under 40-4602D, USD 259 is not a health insurer. Yes. Your Are Honor. there any other rulings below that prevented you from continuing to assert your breach of contract claim? No. And just as a final follow-up, if you were to prevail on those two uh, on on those two issues, presumably USD 259 might still have all of their additional defenses to your breach of contract claim available if it went if it was sent back. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And let, let me jump ahead a little bit to address KSA 40-202B. And if you look, it talks about employees of a particular firm, corporation, or business. It's employees, not employers. And the purpose of my supplemental brief was to address the Court of Appeal statement that if a law was enacted, it would have to mention KSA 40-202B to not be subject to it, assuming it fell into that exception. And I pointed out that businesses, large businesses self-insure their own fleet of vehicles. None of those statutes refer to 40-202B. Well, they came back and said, oh, let me back up. And it is regulated by the Kansas Insurance Department. And look at code or article 31 of chapter 40. Uh, their response was, well, that was the employer, not the employee. Here we're talking about the employees. The employees get no benefit from not having someone watch over the insurance plan. What do you think that, what do you think subsection B means if it doesn't mean what your opponent says it means? I, I think it means that if a particular employee of a insurance business, I think it exempts out employees of the insurance companies from being subject to the insurance code so they won't get in trouble, but the business is still regulated. It's a but, rule of vicarious liability as opposed to individual liability, essentially, yeah. it, under how you would define that term. Right. And, you know, I will tell you, the only thing I know about it is it was introduced by Jacob Drabel in 1927 as part of the original Insurance Act. And yes, that's the great uncle of the retarded turning down the Wichita, Jacob Drabel. But that's the only thing I know. And it hasn't been amended since, since 1927. What do you make of the insurance department's legal conclusion that this provision exempts single payer self-insured plans? I think it was misguided with all due respect to Mr. Amber, who I went to law school with, but. I think it was an erroneous conclusion. What about the Sloan court? Didn't it come to the same conclusion? Yes. But 
you know, Sloan dealt with a regulation that was much different than regulation that we're dealing with today. In Sloan, they had to decide if USD 259 was an insurance company as defined by KSA 40-201. And they said no. But today, not only does it have insurance company in there, but it also has health insurer as defined by KSA 40-4602A. And, but, you know, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said you know, but, um, but I think if the plain language of the statute is not followed, which I don't think the Court of Appeals did, or quite frankly, the trial court, I think chaos will ensue. Because who is going to look over this insurance policy? Not the Kansas Insurance Department, but they're going to look over all other insurance carriers who issue policies in Kansas. So you're exempting one out. Only one class of insurers will be out and will not be subject to like the Patient Protection Act. The Patient Protection Act um, prescribes prohibitions for certain abuses from health insurers and health care plans, such as second guessing insurance or emergency department after the insured had already been to the emergency department, leaving the insured with a huge bill. Can I ask one more? Um... Absolutely statutory construction question i guess yes. um we have two as we already discussed we, we really have isolated your claims at least down to two um two objections to the courts below one based on 40-202 the other based on 40-4602 right and my question is um is there a circular logic between those two issues in other words if if you prevail on the 40-202 argument, do you automatically, from your perspective, prevail, prevail on the 4602 argument? Like, like, are they symbiotic to one another? And I'm not sure. Uh, I At this point, I don't think, because you could still say, well, it talks about employees and they're employers, so it doesn't apply, but it's not a health insurer either. But I think if you look well, at if, it, if it's not a health insurer, you, so you're saying there is a there is a way for this plan to be regulated by the insurance department, but still not be a health insurance. Plan. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm saying that. I now I understand your question. No, uh, it will have to be a health insurer. Be you, you think if you win on forty dash two hundred two, then as a matter of logic and law, yeah. it has to be a health insurance. Plan. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Well, in conclusion, um, I would respectfully point out that on USD 259's website, which has been in all the briefs, it says, when you enroll with Maritime Health, it's important for you to understand your how your health plan works. This way you can make changes you want in your health in your life. And it then says it will send out ID cards. I believe this is important because I, I don't think anybody denies that in fact, USD 259 is a health insurer. They're, they're, they're issuing Kansas insurance policies that should be governed by the Kansas Insurance Department. Thank you. And in final conclusion, and they should be prohibited from subrogating 
under the new expanded regulation. That's Thank not before us, right? What? The, the merits of your contract claim are not before us. No, but I should be allowed to continue, I guess. You want a remand to make yes. those arguments below. It, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm used to being up here when everything's done. So uh, my apologies. That's okay. And by the way, it was only a few times. So thank you for putting up with me. Madam Chief Justice, uh, may it please the court. Um, good morning again. My name is Ryan Meyer and I represent the Appley uh, Cross Appellant USD 259 uh, in this matter. And I want to, I'm certainly going to address uh, Mr. Towns' appeal, but I, I want to start off with what we believe is the fundamental threshold issue. I think I know where you're going with that, but just, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't want you to lose your train of thought, but I, I'm, I would like to just, again, try to, for my own sake, clarify what issues are in front of us. Would Absolutely. you agree with me when you heard me discuss with your colleague, the two um, legal conclusions below that, that were the reasons why the plaintiff lost essentially? Would Ab you agree with that? Absolutely. And were there any other I, I I do not believe so, and and just to further um, speak about that, which I'm sure the court's aware of, the district court reached both the rulings on 4202B and the 4046.02 right. DC uh, issues. The court of appeals, after ruling that the exemption still applies under 4202B, did not reach that issue. Okay, and but then the at where you were going, at least I think I anticipate, is that you have an issue about jurisdiction. Yes. So I, are, are those three issues the universe of issues in front yeah, of us? Absolutely. Okay, thank and, you. In, yeah, I, I was tipping my hand pretty heavily there, I, I think, Justice Stiegel. Uh, where we are going is our cross appeal, which we do not believe has been given. Um, well, it, we, we don't believe it's been decided accurately or properly below or given the attention that this issue deserves and, and frankly makes the other issue, I, I think it, it it necessitates that the court not even reach the other two issues that you had addressed. And this is what the, the, the simple, I guess the simple beginning question is what claim has town actually asserted? And USD 259 absolutely agrees that, it's in the it's in the petition, the class action petition. It's titled breach of contract. There's no dispute there. There's no dispute that the district court has jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction over breach of contract claims. Our issue and and what we've tried to articulate in our in our papers and our briefs in the lower courts and before this court is that no matter what town has styled his claim as, that is not. If you look beyond to the title to the facts which i think this court and all the courts frankly were required to do that is just clearly not what he is alleging that is not his claim his his claim yeah I, I, and just to i may not cite or state them verbatim but he has pled that usd 259 acted on authority of the base plan when it sought subrogation and obtained subrogation in the amount of $1,700 and change from Mr. Town. Paragraph 44 specifically states KAR 40-122 prohibited defendant USD 259 and the applicable base plans dot 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 from subrogating against any third-party recoveries. And then the next paragraph, despite being prohibited from subrogating against third-party recoveries, and then subrogated. There, and, and then he that paragraph goes on to contend that that's a breach of contract. He's doing the exact opposite. Uh, he He's alleging that clearly and specifically that USD 259 complied with the base plan. 
and that what USD 259 didn't do, and he contends can't do, is uh, subrogate because of KAR 40-1-20. Can I ask you a couple of questions about that, this argument? One is maybe which bucket do we put this in? And then second a question about the merits of the argument. Um, is this really a jurisdictional uh, issue, or are you really essentially arguing more of a 6212B6 that that he's failed to state a claim upon which relief can be granted? In other words, the district court still has jurisdiction to decide that question, um, but your argument is essentially just that as a matter of law, he's failed to state a claim for relief. Would you agree with that it's really not a subject matter jurisdiction issue he uh, let me jump in if, that, yeah, if that's yeah let's start there I, I i i've struggled with that very question justice wall and i'd like to say i was smart enough to think about it at the very beginning when i filed our or when we filed our original motion to dismiss i'm not sure that i had articulated it or thought about it well enough at that point and i my 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 answer is I do think it's a subject matter jurisdiction issue instead of a 12B6 issue, and here's why. Although, although I also do not think he stated a breach of contract, but I think it becomes a subject matter jurisdiction issue when the court, I think, is required to analyze, well, what claim is being made apart from the label put on it, and that is a claim for violation of a, uh, of a KAR 40-1-20 that no private right of action attaches to. And I think at that point, it becomes a subject matter jurisdiction. But, if the court but then there should have only been one legal holding, right, of the district court, right, if it lacked jurisdiction. That would be our position that, that the court should have, the district court should have found that it lacked jurisdiction and didn't reach the other two issues. And then I guess my, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Justice Wilson, but just the substantive question I had is, does the severability clause in the contract, isn't that the hook then for the breach of contract claim? In other words, if they re invoke the severability provision, um, they're thereby striking the subrogation as unlawful, um, your action then sort of breaches that reformed agreement pursuant to the severability clause. I don't know if that argument has been made. Um, if 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 that the subrog I'll make sure I understand your question. If the subrogation provision is excised from the base plan, then is there a breach of valid breach of contract based on that provision no longer being in there? Maybe, maybe so. Isn't that the key question in the contract claim? I mean, even if there wasn't a subrogation, a severability clause, I mean, we have, there are numerous common law doctrines under the law of contract that could, um, or that suggest that illegal provisions of a contract are unenforceable. Um, Why isn't that just a straight common law, common uh, contracts 101 question? Well, I, I, I guess I, I don't think it is an illegal provision for one. Sure, but, and you can, uh, and you'll argue that, right? Like, let's let's say you that'll... lose on the jurisdictional claim, you're going to go back and you're going to argue. So, certainly, going to contracts. argue on our twelve b six point. Doesn't that, that suggest that it, in fact, there's a substantive common law contract question at issue here? I, I still, I guess, with the way the petition has been pled. It it's still, which is what we're bound by it at this stage. It only articulates that USD two five nine is complied with the base plan, and doesn't say anything about severability. Doesn't say anything about an illegal con. I mean, I get it doesn't specifically say there's an illegal contract provision. It says we've complied with the base plan, but we've done something that's prohibited by a regulation, which we contend doesn't have a private right of action. Not sure that directly addresses your your question, Justice Wilson. I don't. Uh, Justice Wall addressed my question. Okay. So. Um, 
I don't want to take up all my time on on the jurisdictional cross appeal. I I I guess I, I would like to briefly address Yonkey and and I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm probably not, but I think the both of the district court and the court of appeals were were I would say led astray by what we ab absolutely admit is a difference between the two cases. Yankee did not involve a breach of contract claim. I mean, they clearly were making a claim under the Kansas Small Employer Health Care Act. Now, they later, once once Blue Cross Blue Shield argued for the first time on appeal that, hey, this is a this is a jurisdictional question. There's no no jurisdiction. Well, then they tried to morph it into, oh, well, actually, we're making a contract claim. So Yonke, I think, did did the two step analysis like they should have. They clearly said there's not a breach of contract claim. It wasn't pled. It wasn't tried or adjudicated at summary judgment in that case. Absolutely the case. However, it didn't just stop there and say, well, that's the end of the story. It said, nor is there any breach apparent from the facts. And here, I, that's that's the crux, I think, of Yonke's import to this case is apart from what it's called it's it's looking at is there a breach of contract apparent from from the facts uh i'm i want to since i only have about four minutes left i i do want to um jump to mr town's appeal and uh, if that's the direction you're going i'll jump with my question sure just just um i assume your position is 40-202b exempts this plan from regulation that's your that position. is that is our position yes. can you just walk me through your plain language rationale for why subsection b exempts the school district well 40 as as go ahead and read the note get it out i mean it, it's clearly not uh the most clear statutory provision i'll just go ahead and head ahead and admit that it would it would be a lot better for us if it said nothing contained in this code shall apply to single employer self-funded health plans uh which is which is what we have but i believe that's and at least that's what Sloan has has held that the employees of a particular firm or corporation. That's I, I agree employee. that you have Sloan uh, that says what you just recited, and you also have the insurance department's attorney's opinion, which for whatever that's worth. Um, but uh, you, you're obviously intuiting my question, which is just how do we get from the language the employees to cover employer. <laughs> That's a leap, it seems to me. Well, I, I, I guess I'm going to jump in and not really answer that directly and then try to come back around to it. I think we also have nearly 30 years of legislative knowledge that this is how uh, this provision has been interpreted, multiple opportunities to change that, and it hasn't been done. Uh, so I, I would say we also have that, but I think, you know, it, it certainly doesn't say employers. <laughs> I mean, and you're wanting your, your want your interpretation and, and on your, be, you know, on your behalf, Sloan's interpretation as well is that the language, the statutory language, the employees actually exempts an employer, i.e. USD. Yeah, and and you know, I I don't know if I have, you know, other than relying on Sloan and the insurance departments. I just uh, want, thought maybe there was a rationale there that I was missing that you could fill me in. I I, I don't know if I have a better uh, <laughs> explanation, uh, Judge Stiegel. Um, uh, so yeah, back back to very briefly. Uh, Sloan's appeal. I mean, we we would agree. Well, we would agree the court, or we would articulate that the court shouldn't even reach these issues. But if it does, it's unnecessary to reach them both. Could do what the court of appeals does. I, I 
I think I'll spend my remaining minute answering a question you you asked of of uh, Mr. Gott, which is that if you win, if you reverse on forty two o two, does that necessarily mean the same result has to apply under forty forty six o two DC? And I would say no. I, I would say that would eliminate the exemption for the single employer self-funded plan, but it doesn't automatically mean that under 4602D, that single employer self-funded plan is a health insurer under that statute as it's been defined. And for the reasons we've articulated it, and and it's it's a single employer self-funded plan, which is not, doesn't fit into any of those four situations that uh, articulated as a health benefit plan and then the hook to get them into to being a health uh, insurer and and how do you know. deal with the residual clause though that you know, I know it identifies a sort of list of of issues that are not health plans but there there's a residual clause too right are you referring to 40 uh, 602d or or c uh, I'll have to look here. Probably D, but I, think I don't it's want D, D, which says any D. other entity which offers a health benefit. Yeah, which is absolutely what uh, Mr. Town is relying on that portion of 4602D. Right. And then that gets you to C, which defines the four situations that can be a health benefit plan. He's only claiming two of those fit the bill and none neither one of those is a single employer self-funded plan and again i it would be easier if the legislature would use the same language but uh that's a lot of your job i i suspect <laughs> um i am out of time um ha i'm happy to respond to any further questions i feel like i've I've ignored the two justices over here. At least <laughs> you've seen this shoulder a lot. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll I'll take my seat and thank you. At your reserve four minutes. May it please the court, Troy Gott, representing Timothy Town. And I let me quickly dispose of Yonke. Yonke, the, the plaintiff said, yeah, we alleged a breach of contract. Unfortunately, those words did not even appear in any document in the court file. It's hard to make a breach of contract claim if you don't mention breach of contract. In our case, not only did we admit breach of contract, but we also attached um, a health care plan, a copy of the health care plan, which is read into it. And again, that gets back to the conformity with the laws of the state. But also, as Justice Stiegel noted there are common law rules of construction which is if there is a law and the insurance contract is somehow inconsistent with it the provision in the contract will be uh, struck as void and replaced with the law so i believe we filed a notice pleading which is exactly what it is and that's all we were required to do and i believe we made a breach of contract claim any questions now i i want to talk again or revisit the letter that the insurance department attorney wrote Mr. Ember and I want to remind the court that he was writing that letter when before the 
regulation was expanded. And before the Patient Protection Act, the Patient Protection Act, along with other statutes, were passed in 1997 to bring Kansas in compliant with HIPAA. So it is Kansas counterpart to the federal statute HIPAA. So, but now, even when the, the legislative, legislative history is clear, the reason that they wanted to expand it is because they were tired of people, of entities, being able to segregate because of a technicality, which to me means Kansas stands firm that in this context, there should be no segregation. But again, the language of 46, 40-4602 C and D are clear and should be followed. They, USD 259 issued a policy, and it was also a health insurer who issued an agreement to its insured employees, and as a result, on the catch-all phrase in the uh, health insurer definition, which is a health benefit plan, that is subject to the Kansas statutes annotated, not just the insurance code, but Kansas, uh, it becomes a health insurer. But is there any questions? Well, I would just like to thank everybody for their time. And if history holds right, I'll see you guys in six years. Thank you. Thank you to both counsel for your arguments today. Um, the court will take this appeal under advisement.